Thanks uh, very much for having me here. Thanks to TJ for allowing us to use his shop. I know it's a long day for him. Um, I'll give you a little quick background about me. Um, I grew up here in Orlando. I uh, worked at SeaWorld as a biologist. I caught my first fish when I was four, had my first aquarium at six, worked at SeaWorld for 10 years in the aquarium department. Um, the guys I worked with wanted to make it sound like they were all famous biologists, but really what we did is scrubbed algae and sucked up shark shit most of the time. So, uh, so um, did a lot of collecting. Uh, I was one of the youngest ones they've ever hired, and uh, that was because I had boating experience and I knew how to fish and tie knots. Most of the guys really didn't. Uh, worked at a fish hatchery for a couple of years, and then I worked for an aquaculture company designing fish farms, aquaculture facilities, and lake aeration systems. So my background is fish, but I love fishing. I always joked around with people that I'll help you take care of them during the week, and on the weekends I'm going to go out and kill every one of them I can. But, <laughs> but that's changed. That was a long time ago, and now it's all catch and release. Uh, actually, I don't think I've killed a fish purposefully in about 15 years. So, so I have a unique perspective. I love fish, and I love studying fish, and I love figuring out all about fish, but at the same time I like going out and catching them. So it gives me... Um, I, I just enjoy trying to figure out what makes them tick. And one of my favorite fish is the American Shad. And it's a unique fish. Uh, are all of you familiar with them, with the Shad? Has anyone not fished for American Shad? Okay, so just a couple, okay. Um, it, and let me back up for a second. If you guys can hold your questions, I get sidetracked really easily. And I can go off on a tangent for hours and we've got a limited amount of time. I've got a tremendous amount of info. Uh, I know you want to learn how to catch them, but I think it's as important, if not more important, to figure out more about the fish itself. So let me go ahead and start here. Um, I'm going to identify and discuss, locate um, uh, the fishing areas and where they might be hanging out, and then there's something interesting that's coming down the pike for our St. John's River. Some of you may know about it. Um, it's not always the best news. So here's my favorite fish. Okay, you guys are confused. This is supposed to be a joke. These are steelhead. Okay. Which, believe it or not, shad have a lot in common with. Uh, how about this? Does that look familiar? Okay. That's actually a hickory shad. Um, there's American shad, hickory shad, and gizzard shad that we have in the river. A lot of people um, can't tell the difference. I'm going to try to help you figure that out a little bit because we have a pretty unique fishery here. We have both of them. Um, the state record hickory shad, or actually the world's record hickory shad, was caught right here in the Econ River. It's two pounds, 14 ounces. The world's record American shad was caught up, I believe, in Delaware. It's 11 pounds. But our Florida shad, American shad, is only um, a little over five pounds. So I just showed you the two. Here's a better comparison right here. That looks pretty obvious. But when you're standing there on the banks of the St. John's River and you have one in your hand, it's not as obvious as you think. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how they may look. Um, American Shad, bigger, rounder. The mouth ends perfectly right here. The Hickory Shad has a little underbite. And a, a good way to remember it is if everybody takes their finger and makes an OK, just do that. Make an OK. See how your little thumb is sticking out on the bottom? It's okay to catch a hickory shad. That's a good way to remember it. You'll see that and know right away that you've got a hickory. There's a little bit of a better view of the mouth. And if you guys can't hear me in the back, let me know. Wave or something. Okay. Thanks. Here's an old line drawing of the two. Um, it, it's really unique that the largest hickory shad is here in Florida but we don't get very big American shad. All tackle record, 11 pounds. All tackle for the uh, hickory is two pounds. They're anadromous, which means they live in salt water like a salmon, and they run upstream to spawn. We have another unique fish that lives in the St. John's River that does the complete opposite of that. Does anybody know what that is? No, it's the uh, American eel. It lives in fresh water and then it runs out to the Sargasso Sea and spawns offshore. Um, 
the adult American shad can release up to 600,000 eggs. This is a good time to talk about catch and release and taking very good care of the females when you do catch them. Um, I am a big fan of barbless hooks. I'm also a big fan of nets. And I didn't bring my net, but I use a very large net that's very shallow. It has a pretty long handle on it. You know, if you're using four-pound test or six-pound test, you catch a couple of shad, you're going to start popping shad off trying to land them. And I love using a big net. you got control of them very quickly, and you're not hurting them. Okay, so here's salmon. And I said that these are very similar to salmon. What's unique about salmon is that after they spawn, what happens? They die. In Mother Nature, wasting an animal just doesn't happen. There's a reason for that fish to die. Anybody have an idea why? <laughs> Partially, yeah. Bingo. Absolutely. That's a smart guy right here. Uh, salmon spawn in really pure streams where there's no nutrients. When they run upstream, they give the ultimate sacrifice after they spawn. They die. Their bodies go downstream, they decompose, and then when the eggs hatch, the fry have a little egg yolk that goes along with them for a couple of days, but then they've still got maybe a, a thousand miles of river to go down. And the first part of those rivers are pretty much nutrient-free until they get the nutrients off of the dead salmon. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so, so stick with me. But Atlantic salmon don't die. So not all salmon are hardwired to give themselves up. There's two ways to describe it, um, or one way for each style. Uh, semel parity is what salmon do. They spawn once, and they die. Um, I thought that was going to happen when I was in high school, but uh, <laughs> their dads wanted me to be, or actually they didn't want me to be this way. Iteroparity means they spawn over and over and over. You can look that up. Um, so stick with me. I'm still going somewhere with this. American shad are not hardwired to die. Everywhere else in the country, people know that the American shad will spawn and then go back out to sea, and they'll come back and return the following year. For some reason, they talk about Florida shad dying. Has anybody seen a massive die-off of American shad in the St. John's River? Nobody? Okay. Um, here's, uh, they, they do feed when they're in the water, or in the, uh, in the rivers, and uh, if they feed actively, they have a higher likelihood of repeat spawning. Well, it's true everywhere else in the country, hickory shad, <clears throat> the scientists have found, <clears throat> actually spawn. I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. They actually feed in our river. So in the same river that supposedly our St. John's River American shad die in, the hickory shad feed and then go back out to sea and then come back. It's, um, it's strange that we're thinking that the uh, Americans have to die. There's no reason for them to do that. There's plenty of food in the water. The hickories will do it right next to them. They don't get stressed out. Um, obviously, <laughs> what's that? And where are the bodies? Yeah, and exactly, where are the bodies? Um, there's something else that's really interesting, too. The largest American shad, 11 pounds, is up north. They say that our shad go to the same feeding grounds as those other shad up north. Well, if, theoretically, they live four or five years and then come here and die after spawning, you would think after tens of thousands of years of feeding in the same area that other shad get to 11 pounds, why don't ours get to 11 pounds? Makes you think, doesn't it? Um, what I think happens is that they don't go all the way up to the Bay of Fundy where everyone else thinks that all the American shad go. I think some of them may go up there, but I think they're going to stay farther down off of our continental shelf, uh, maybe off of North Carolina or someplace. No one's proved it yet. No one's disproved it. Uh, there's not a lot of money in shad research. And if you're not a college student working on your doctorate uh, or a, f a government funding um, agency that's given money to uh, FWC or whatever, uh, there's really just not a lot of research that's being done on them. I'm just trying to make you think that uh, 
They don't all give themselves up. This is one of their food fish uh, that we find in their stomachs here in the St. John's River. These are gambusia. They look like little guppies. When the river's tree line to tree line and in its floodplain, there's gambusia and these little grass shrimp. And the whole floodplain is full of them. And as the water recedes, they get kind of vacuumed or squeegeed off the, the floodplain into the river, and it becomes this moving conveyor belt of food. So there's a tremendous amount of food that's out there. In the 1870s, American shad were taken over to uh, the west coast of the United States and released in the Sacramento River area. They've actually, on their own, they're now down into Mexico. They've spread themselves all the way out to the very top uh, into Alaska. Here in the U.S., the southern limits are the St. John's River. And then they go all the way up here to uh, St. Lawrence Seaway and, and that area. Uh, all these shad out here don't die after spawning. And they say that, once again, ours do, but uh, I don't think they all do. Um, I kind of went over that. That's a study from the University of Idaho saying that they don't die out there. Is anyone familiar with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey water datum site? Is anyone not familiar with it? Okay. There are thousands of these monitoring stations around the country on rivers, streams, even on Holliver Canal. And what they do is they give daily reports of water levels, temperatures, water flow. They also give temperature. We're the only shad spawning area where the shad wait for the water to cool off. Everywhere else in the country, they wait for the water to warm up. Um, 67, 68 degrees. It'll get a little cooler in uh, January on occasion, but um, 18 degrees Celsius is about 64 uh, Fahrenheit. And you can see that in December it's just about 17. Um, I've caught shad as early as the second week of November. And last year was a good year for that because the water was extremely low. It doesn't happen all the time. Usually mid-December is when we start going out looking for them. Uh, so temperatures are still pretty warm, and uh, they can handle it. <clears throat> What's interesting about uh, the shad is we think they're just a seasonal visitor here for a couple of months. Uh, we've picked them up in November, and I know guys that have caught them in June. So they're here for almost eight months, the adults. Uh, the young, the fry, I believe, are here year-round. They get to a certain size, and then they go out in big pulses out into the, uh, the ocean through uh, the inlet there in Jacksonville. Okay, this is gauge height in feet above sea level. This is from reference points from 1929. This really doesn't mean much. There's two charts if you go to the website. There's this one, and then another one looks identical, but it's adjusted for global warming and the oceans rising. I just started focusing in on this one. And uh, when the water level gets to four and a half feet, right here, the river's within its banks, the water flow is perfect, and it's a beautiful world out on the St. John's River for shad fishing. It um, can be five and a half feet or six, and it can be really good conditions all the way down to 520. I was down there the other day. I picked up one shad down by 520. I picked up four by the mouth of the Econ. Um, but the river there, has anybody been in that area recently? I mean, it's, it's high. But it's dropping like a rock. It's really coming down fast. I tried to go back longer, like 10 or 15 years, to show you how this works. But this is a pretty good idea that uh, June, which is right about in here, is the driest month. It's the lowest water level. Then we start getting our rains for the summer, and it'll spike on back up, and then we coast back down. June, May, somewhere in that area, we get rains again. As far back as you go, or can go on this, it's the same cycle. It'll go up to seven or eight feet. Hurricane Fay went to 11 feet. Does anybody remember how much water was out there at that point? It was crazy. Uh, but once the plug gets pulled, it really starts dropping fast. We had June, 
normal, and then it went up, and then we got a kind of a big bump maybe a month ago. Remember those 20 inches of rain? I think, uh, actually, it came up 22 inches. It was about 11 inches of rain here in the Orlando area. Um, so it kind of gave it another little spike. But I can tell you that it's well on its way down. So this shows the height. There's also CFS, cubic feet per second. And that's the important thing, that once the river gets down to a certain level, there's got to be enough flow for the, the shad to spawn in. When they spawn, they do it in the evenings, right about dusk, and they go to about midnight. Has anybody seen them washing, which is the term for spawning? Okay, it's pretty neat to see. You think you're going to catch a lot of fish? You usually don't because they're so busy spawning. There'll be one female and as many as 10 or 12 males trying to follow them. Um, and it goes off into the darkness, and it's spectacular. When they really start coming out, uh, you know you're in the right spot for the next day because there are a lot of fish. Uh, the CFS, once again, the cubic feet per second, they need at least 800 to be in an ideal zone. Um, right now, I think we're at about 1,500, so we're still high. We're at just about six feet above sea level, so about a foot and a half above ideal. But if you go down towards 520, anyone know where Possum Bluff is on 520? It's just south of the Beeline Expressway. The river there is beautiful. It's perfect. Um, I'm going to start focusing more down that way right now. I know that there's fish down at Mullet Lake Park. Has anybody fished in that area recently? You caught any? Okay. So there's fish there. I'm not a big Mullet Lake Park fisherman. Um, I like the intimacy, the fun of fishing farther upstream and um, fishing the braided channels. Uh, a neat way to look at the river is like a giant ebbing tide. It's always moving out. It's always draining. And if you guys snook fish or fish the uh, flooded marsh, you know that certain stages or, or parts of a dropping tide, the fish are going to hold in certain areas. Well, it's the same with the American shad. Where you find them today, there may be a few there, but, you know, in a week or two, but they're going to be somewhere else where the river is more conducive to the spawning. And when they spawn, it's free spawning or free swimming. They spawn, the eggs get fertilized, and then they sink down to the bottom, and they sink into sandy areas. And then the current is washing over them, and it takes about three or four days here in Florida for the temperatures to get the eggs to hatch. In other places, it can take as long as a week, but it's colder in those places as well. Um, here is, uh, I did go back to 2007 right here. And then here is, um, I don't remember what that event was. That may have been Faye. Was that Faye in that year, 2008? Okay. Um, so you can see peaks and valleys up and down. Last year, 2014, was extremely low. We had perfect water level in November. And I knew we were going to have a tough year. Those fish weren't going to push all the way up. There was current farther downstream. Did anybody have 100 fish days last year in January? Okay. 100 fish days are not impossible. just depends on how much time you want to go out there um, or stay out there. I'm not a big fan of pounding fish in the same spot over and over. Uh, I love to explore. You know, I ask people, how many are you going to need to catch to have a good day? And you know, if they tell me 100, it's going to be a problem because, you know, that's going to be a long day sometimes. Um, what I like to do is find where a few of them are, and then I just keep running. And I'll run from 46 all the way up to State Road 50. I've run from 50 all the way down to 520. And I've got a little 15 horse on my riverboat, and it's a lot better to run by myself. Um, so don't be offended if I don't want to take you. Um, <laughs> I'll bring some extra gas uh, cans, and I'll find fish all the way through. I've found them through Point Set all the way to Lake Washington. And has anybody ever gone down that far on the St. John's River? There's a weir. Yeah, well, it's, you know, here's a fish that lives somewhere off of our coast. And it comes 300 miles upstream. And everybody focuses on Mullet Lake Park, or they go, or Shad Alley, that area there. Or they go to 46 and everybody stands next to each other right there where the econ dumps out. Uh, I can go around the corner through Puzzle and I can have three miles of nothing up there, uh, people-wise, and, uh, and tear them up. Or I can run all the way up into the econ and catch them. And the econ's pretty unusual, too, because 
Hickory shad like the tributaries. They'll go up in the Wakaiva. They'll go up into Christmas Creek. They'll go into Taylor Creek. Um, but they love the econ. They like more of the little tributaries. And if you look at uh, Dave Chermansky, who's got all these records, he caught most of his hickory shad out of the econ. There's also American shad in there as well, but um, it's really a great hickory shad place. Um, if it weren't for the dam, and I always get this park wrong, off of Dean Road, uh, is it Blanchard Park? Okay, so you guys know about that. There's a big dam there. If it weren't for that dam, the dam shad would be all the way up in Orlando. I guarantee it. Um, does anybody remember the manatee that got stuck there? Okay, so I'm not imagining things and I'm not making it up. A manatee worked its way all the way up the econ to that park and got stuck there. The water started to recede and they sent SeaWorld out to go pick them up. So it's not crazy or a stretch to have the hickories go all the way up in there. That's just some extra info. This is State Road 50 looking south upstream. Um, we're pretty familiar with that this year. Water is pretty far up, almost tree line to tree line. Here's when it starts to drop a little bit and get a little more channelized. And those are the conditions that I really like to look for when I see an exposed bank. This edge right here is the outer edge. The river is sweeping along this way and then heading down and then making another turn. The fish are right in here. They're right there at your feet. You don't have to make long casts. You don't have to go very far. They are right at your feet on a good day. Uh, I'll look for fish splashing on the surface. I look for turns. When I'm running, I'll look way off in the distance and look for little turns flying around. They're dropping down and picking up minnows and shrimp off the surface. And a lot of times the shad are pushing them up to the surface. They're eating. And if you don't think they are, open up a couple of them and take a look inside. You can stand in a spot like this. you got a little bit of a ripple. This is sticking out pretty far. You can make a long cast, and I'll show you what I do as far as cast. And uh, let that fly swing in the water and just hang there and do really well when they're there. Here's the current running down. I like to cast across the current and let it swing. And I don't mend, I just let a big U go in the line and let it swing across. All these fish, they can be anywhere out here in the channel uh, and looking forward in the current. And if your fly goes across a bunch of noses, you're going to get a bite off of one of them. But just casting straight down the current we're casting straight up the current. You know, there may not be anything in that little seam that you're casting in. So cast across the current, drop your rod tip if you're fly fishing, hold your line tight. I use a floating line. I use a seven or eight foot leader, and I'll show you the flies that I use. Um, I just let it swing across. I don't always go to a sink tip, hardly ever do that. I'm lazy and I catch enough fish with the floating line. I can add a longer leader. Uh, but I'll also use little lures, and I'll show you those here in a second as well. Um, water level is at four and a half feet, and game on. This is perfect. We're going to probably see this um, in about another three and a half or four weeks. The river can drop about four inches a week. That's if everything's perfect. If you watch the gauge, does anybody remember um, Ferris Bueller's day off when the clock went backwards and he screamed? Well... If you watch the water gauge, you'll see it stop and go back up. Uh, it, did it did it today. We had this hellacious north wind that started backing the river up. And if you've ever been to uh, Green Cove Springs, Palatka, any of that area of the St. John's River, the river flows backwards there when the tide's coming in. So throw in a strong tide, throw in a strong wind, uh, it'll back the river up and hold it. When it stops and starts going the other way, it's like you pull the plug and it'll just run right out. And keep in mind, it's still like a forever tide. You've got to go up and find out where the fish are and either follow them back, or sometimes they may go farther up, depending on what part of the river. Uh, the river drops on average about an inch a mile. The upper river uh, can drop as much as two inches in a mile. And then you get down to Mullet Lake Park, it's like a quarter inch. It's like just syrup running through there. So the steeper gradient is farther upstream, which can be a good thing. Um, I like going up in that area and poking around. There's nobody there except airboaters, redneck jet skis. Um, so I like going up in there and looking around. I was talking about Shad Alley earlier. 
this area right in here. Historically, that was the place to go because of marketing. Lemon Bluff and Marina Isle, they were in competition. They wanted to get everybody out there and catch these fish. We had a lot of Yankees that were coming down here who were very familiar with shad because they, they have shad festivals up north. There's a bush called the shad bush, and when it starts to bloom, people lose their minds, and little communities have shad festivals. Um, so everybody thinks that's a great spot, and it's, it's good, but it's not my kind of fishing. I don't like dredging and standing out there in the middle, and I like coming way up and trying, trying to hunt them. As the crow flies from here, government cut down to Lake Washington, there's a little weir right there. That's 50 miles as the crow flies. Add about another, conservatively, 15 miles of bends and twists and, and this little section right over here. You've got about 65 miles of water where the American shad can be. It's not just at the mouth of the St. Uh, St. John's and Econ. Um, so don't be afraid to experiment. And I know it's really tough because it's such a short window of opportunity. You know, in a good year, you might have six weeks where you have the desire to go chase them and the word's out. By the time the word's out, it's kind of like cobia fishing over at the coast. The good <laughs> stuff has already happened, and, uh, you know, you're, you're a little late. Um, so there's great places all the way down through there. This is just an arbitrary section of the river. Nothing secret. Nothing secret. Uh, <laughs> GPS numbers. Um, the river, these areas right here, this is, uh, a geologist told me, it's Tomoka Fine Sand. There are a lot of different types of soils that we have in the state. This is beach sand. The state was uh, underwater. And we had the dunes, uh, the, the central ridge, the highlands, Claremont all the way down to uh, like Sebring. Um, we got lucky at some point. You know where 528 goes over into the uh, Indian River? Just as it starts to reach right there, see those giant bluffs right there? Those are historic old dunes. That could have been like another Claremont with the big hills right there. Um, fortunately, the river flows north and drains all that area rather than all the water just sheet flowing straight into the Atlantic Ocean. So we're fortunate to have the St. John's River. Um, so all this sand, this is great areas for the, uh, the shad to spawn. And what I would do is if I plopped into a spot like this, I would, uh, I would stand right here and I would make long casts out and let it drag along this. And then I'd start like steelhead fishing, take a couple of steps, make some casts, take a few steps, make some casts. I would work my way through this bend if I don't see fish visibly busting on the surface. And if you're not occasionally snagging or catching a little muscle, you're not fishing deep enough. I'm sure everyone here who's ever used a fly or a little grub shad fishing has been the one lucky guy in the world to catch a muscle. If you have it, you're not fishing deep enough. If you have, you're not the one lucky guy because I've seen guys catch three or four on a fishing trip. Here's another area, white sand. Love that. Uh, what else I love are where little places like this kind of feed into the main river. I've had people say that for some reason they catch a lot of fish where those little creeks and things flood into. Well, the reason for that is all the shrimp and all the minnows that are getting squeegeed off this floodplain are coming out, and it's like a little feeder and the fish are stacking up right there. If the current's good, there's a sandy bottom, they're going to sit right there, and they're going to suck in those fish and eat them. Does this look familiar to anybody? Okay. Um, this is uh, just east of the east ramp at C.S. Lee on 46. This is the Morgan Alderman property. You can pay three bucks and have access without having to drop a boat in to the St. John's River in a pretty good spot. It's a little old lady that sits there and collects the money. Here's uh, the ramp 46 right here. There's a road right here, Morgan Alderman Road. Follow it all the way out and you pay her. You ought to see the view that this lady has. It's incredible. Really neat. And you can come out here and drive right up to this in a dry year and fish this section right here. There's a great um, sunshine bass hole right there, or striper hole, and then really good shad fishing along that if you don't have a boat. 
Okay, I've mentioned a fish that I'm going to talk about really quickly, and I want to give you my personal opinion on sunshine bass. Everybody loves catching them, right? I mean, it makes your day if you get one. Um, they're not native. They are Frankenstein fish. The reason that they're created is because they're extremely aggressive strikers. They like to feed aggressively. FWC would rather stock sunshine bass because it's been this hero story for them versus stripers, which are naturally part of the St. John's River. And there are stripers that are naturally reproducing in the river. But FWC wants to continue this Frankenstein fishery because it keeps jobs going and it is a popular game fish because it strikes aggressively. Well, I asked them, what research have they done on the impact of these big, hard-striking fish on the small American shad population? They couldn't answer me. Not only that, they didn't want to talk to me. Um, what's that? They really do. And um, uh, it's a government-run organization. I'm not here to preach politics or anything, but... Um, they, uh, they do some really interesting things, and this is one of them. From a biological standpoint, uh, it's a perpetual stocking. It's um, perpetual money being spent on it, whereas if it was spent on regular stripers, there would be a point maybe where we wouldn't have to stock them anymore. Uh, the other interesting thing is uh, if you have to stock natural fish like stripers, you've pretty much failed as stewards of the environment because you have not paid attention to the end where it's being damaged, the population. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to go into much more about that. Any FWC people here? <laughs> okay. My name is TJ Bettis. If, uh, it, here's a closer view. Um, uh, Mrs. Alderman's house is right here. You can drive in, drive across this. People are cane pole fishing here. Um, striper hole right there. Some really good fishing right through there. Here's some great news for you kayakers. Really terrible news for anybody that has a boat. This is at State Road 46 East at C.S. Lee. Boat ramp closed for renovations. This year, January 19th through February 13th. Guys, right in the very middle of shad fishing. Yep. So soak that up and... Uh, if anybody's ever worked with a government agency and they know what their timelines are, this is really going to be a problem for anybody other than kayakers. Uh, we're going to have to get creative and put in it up at Hatville, or I'm going to see a lot more people in other places of the river. But isn't that great? And then anybody like to spec fish at night on Lake Harney? That's hilarious. No overnight. Thing. An excessive noise of any kind. The FWC airboat I saw the other day was louder than any of the other airboats. So... <laughs> C.S. Lee, yeah, it's State Road 46 East, so right there by the Econ, so. And that's Jolly Gators. Right? That's Jolly Gator, yeah. Jolly Gators has uh, been sold and bought by someone new. Um, I stopped there the other day and had lunch. It's adequate. Adequate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got beer. <laughs> Just a couple things. Um, you guys probably all know this. I like a four or five weight fly rod. Uh, fly line, six to nine foot leaders, flies barbless, even spinning tackle barbless, knee boots, Canaveral Reeboks, whatever you want to call them, um, sun protection, camera net, love the big net idea. Binoculars are really helpful for looking downstream for birds and seeing if anybody else is catching anything. Um, and I like to anchor up with uh, a mushroom anchor. And I do something that I don't suggest you do anywhere else where there's moving water or in, in, in any other kind of river. I like to anchor from the stern so that I have a nice clean bow pointing downstream so that people can fly cast off that. You can land fish. You don't have a polling platform or anything else. Any other river or any really low uh, transom boat, uh, I'd be really careful and also be really careful about air boaters going by because you'll ship water and you'll go down like a rock. But I take my chances. There are my flies, and I'm going to pull some out here. You can stare at that. 
Um, any color is fine. I have uh, no personal preference. And when you hear guys talking about switching flies because they're not hitting oranges anymore, that's horse crap. What's happened is a pulse of shad have gone through, and uh, and there's no shad or, or fewer shad. And then a little while later, another pulse of shad will come through. What I've done, which I thought um, I wasn't going to share with you guys, I've corked fish where I've caught fish, and then I've taken a big float and about 12 feet of mono and a hook, and I've put it into a shad that I've caught, and I bend the bar back a little bit, or the uh, point back, and I release the shad, and I'll sit there and watch that float, and watch what he does, and I'll follow him up to the next pool. I've spent, I've been really fortunate, I've had a lot of time, <laughs> and I've got a very supportive wife, and this is the researcher, biologist, fish guy in me. I just love figuring out what's going on. Um, I've watched them for hours. Sometimes they go into other pools. Sometimes they drift down. Uh, I'll do two or three just to make sure that this guy isn't, you know, riding the short bus and, and <laughs> hanging out in the wrong area. Um, and they'll get together, and you'll see them swim back by. And before I leave, it's real easy. I cast out, and I catch the line. I pull them up, and I release them. I let them go. But I'll carry in my bag my corking outfit. And any of you guys that spec fish, any spec fishermen in here? You catch a big spec when you first get out there, or the fifth spec. Do the same thing to him and put him over, and watch where he goes. He's going to go right back to the school and just fish right around that guy. Um, yeah. Yeah, and here's what's really bad. Um, the, uh, the redfish guys that fish the tours, I won't even tell you what I think about them, but... Uh, they'll go out and they'll catch redfish and they'll get a big Pepsi liter bottle and they'll cork a fish and then they'll come back the next day during the tournament and they'll look for their Pepsi liter bottle and they'll go over and catch the fish. It's, you know, I'm calling it research. They're calling it whatever. Money. <laughs> yeah. And here's what we like. Big high jumps. A uh, lot of fun. Oh, you know what I'll do? Let me, uh, let me show you what I use for spinning. Um, eighth ounce jig heads, doesn't matter what color, and little two inch twisty tails. These were salt impregnated ones. Um, what I would do is uh, I'd take them and rinse them all off because if you put them in there with your hooks, guess what you had the following shad year? A lot of rusty hooks. Um, Something as simple as that on a little five and a half or six foot rod with a four pound test. And I cast it out just like I do a fly. And I let it swing. And the current tells me how fast I should be going. And I just keep my rod tip down, let it swing, and then just really reel it slow. Super slow. That's it. And with the current, it's almost, it's almost hanging there. Here's something that's really funny. I'm going to show you a picture here in a minute. Let me get to it. This is great. This is uh, some of the women from the uh, Fanatics Fly Fishing Club uh, having a field day out here by the uh, mouth of the Econ. Super easy place for them to get to and uh, super safe, and they have a great time. They catch shad, and they catch, check out that, on a fly rod. That's what I said. That's, that's spectacular. That's a, yeah. Uh, there's a little shad right there. Water's a little high. Water was probably at about uh, five feet on the gauge. And, uh, oops. Oh, well, yeah, forget it. Um, muscle. There's a pretty good size one right there. You can see I have a really big net. Um, anybody know what koi carp are? The little Japanese carp that people have in their water gardens? Uh, the koi people are crazy about water gardens, and they buy these big special nets that are really shallow. I got a couple of those custom made and had the handles modified. Uh, if I'm standing up on a bank, I don't want to be bending over all day, and I don't want to be trying to lift up with four-pound test, a three- or four-pound shad. So I use that big net. Get it wet first and then pick them up. It's 26 inches, I think. Yeah, pretty substantial. It looks ridiculous. Uh, yeah, shallow. but really shallow, yeah. 
Okay. Um, fish, uh, that's a turkey buzzard, but there's birds flying around. Um, this is really neat. When you pull your boat up onto the bank, there's a little current coming off the edge right here. And you'll have shrimp and minnows right at the transom of your boat, right at the stern. And I fish with a couple of guys who have really nice boats and lots of tackle. And uh, we have sat there with cane poles and little jigs and have had an absolute field day. Yeah, so you don't have to come in here and buy a fly rod from TJ. You can go get a cane pole. Just kidding, TJ. <laughs> TJ will have cane poles up here. Um, it's eight hundred. Yeah, 800, exactly. <laughs> Payment plan. Um, shad fishing, you know, you can, um, 30 years ago, if you were on a lake in Florida and you passed by another boater, you waved. Uh, yesterday, if you passed by somebody on Mosquito Lagoon, you know, 15 feet away, they wouldn't even look at you. Um, but shad fishing, there's this coconut telegraph. There are guys that I don't talk to for nine months out of the year. And then when shad season comes, we start getting phone calls, emails, what are you finding, what's going on, and it is so much fun. It's unlike any other kind of fishing. It's like a dove hunt on water, and guys are always curious about where the fish are. They'll run way down south and, and give you a call, and then the next day you go down there and you know meet up with them and catch fish there, and it's, it's really cool to, to keep up with it. Um, here's the econ at very low water. Uh, I've had guys go up in here in April and catch fish at low water. Um, for the next three months, January, February, beginning of March, shad is my life. I just love them. I'm going after them. Uh, they're still there in March and going into April, and I'll still go after them a little bit, um, but I'm turkey hunting that time of year, and I would rather do that. Here's that little thing about the... Uh, um, Watch him finger, the uh, manatee getting stuck up there. This is that last bend right before you go into the trees at the mouth of the econ. Uh, really low water, there's still fish there, plenty of fish. And there's a lot of speck in that corner right there as well. And all the fish that are coming out of the econ, uh, they'll hang there for a day or two. And if you time it right, you can do really well right in that spot. And once again, really white sand, that's what they want to have. And there's really great current. You can see how steep this is. Um, and then controlled fire. And any any quail hunters here? Okay. This is your worst nightmare. This is the worst thing ever. And uh, as a biologist, I see this, and um, I'll tell you very quickly, because it's a great audience to tell this to. Um, fires are wonderful. They're needed in, uh, in nature. We know that 98, we didn't do enough of it prior to that, and we paid the price. Um, the problem is fires in nature are started by lightning, and that's only during the rainy season. And when you get a lightning strike from lightning, or and a fire started by lightning, very quickly afterwards you get a dousing of rain. So you have this mosaic of burned, not burned. It's it's a patchwork, and it's it's a beautiful thing. The state mandates a certain amount of acres to be burned every year. The best time of year for that is in the winter. Winter is not the time of year to do it. When they burn, they burn thousands of acres. It's a hot fire, and now they expose um, young birds like quail to raptors that migrate down here during the winter because we're on the flyway, and all the hawks and harriers and falcons come down here. Between fire ants and prescribed burns in the winter, we've lost our quail population. This gentleman is nodding his head in agreement. Um, Quail hunting is not going someplace and paying eight bucks a bird and uh, for a bird that doesn't even want to fly and the dogs get half of them. Um, Florida used to be wide open savannas and it was because of control of, of na natural fires. Anyway, I'll get off that, get off my high horse. We had quail in like behind neighborhoods back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of it's because of fire ants, but there aren't fire ants everywhere, and uh, most of it is because of the burns. It's the wrong time of year. burns up all their forage, and then it exposes them to raptors. Um, there's a hellacious bend right here in this current. When you get a north wind on the St. John's River, it's your best friend because it's going to 
back up the river a little bit, create some chatter, and you'll be able to see the current. A north wind is also your best friend for running in the St. Johns River if you're not familiar where you're running. Uh, if the water is up and you're cruising along and you're paying attention, you'll see rougher water. That's your highway because that's the strongest current. And a north wind is pushing against that current and it stands it up a little bit and you can run all over the place. So don't be scared to do that. And there's sections of the river that are, it, it's just incredible you can be running through a channel this wide and it's seven feet deep and there are shad right there you can you know you can drop a net down and get them another shad just some obligatory shots I'll move out of your way um, catfish hotel anybody know where this is okay this is right smack dab in the middle of shad country it's south of 50 about four and a half five miles and here are your buddies <laughs> and what I was saying about FWC, there are some, and I've got great friends that are in FWC. They're dedicated, loyal biologists and dedicated law enforcement guys. But the overall programs that they talk about doing, you need to question them because it's not what they appear to be. Oh. Uh, this is up in Georgia at the Buford Highway Fish Market. It is probably the biggest uh, farmer's market. It's probably the biggest fish market I've seen inside this farmer's market. And they're selling shad and they're also selling grass carp. Giant grass carp. It's amazing. Okay, I'm getting close to wrapping it up. Uh, here's water. This is the St. John's Water Management District. <clears throat> I was telling you that there's something coming down the road for the uh, shad that might be a problem. We just became the third most populous state. We surpassed New York. I think we're at 19.7 million people. Um, the Mormons south of uh, the Bee Line own 300,000 acres. They released their 60-year plan, development plan. It's going to be rivaling Orlando as a development. So we've got more people coming. And with more people, we have a demand for more water. And water's key for the uh, for the development the water management districts the WMD weapons of mass destruction they aren't what you think they are anybody here work for them because <laughs> I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you and uh, and won't hesitate at all they're not there just to protect the water we already have EPA DEP we have branches of government that are there to protect the water quality Water management districts are there to have water for future use. And they've done some things where they've bought huge tracts of land, undisturbed, beautiful, natural vegetation. Uh, they're going to build big berms around them, and they're going to flood them. They're going to scrape them out, but they're going to flood them, and they're going to get the water from the St. John's River. They're going to start pumping water out of the St. John's River into these big reservoirs. And they've got quite a few of them picked out across the state. Because of this, they've started to do damage control. They've sent some money to the researchers to go out. These are plankton toes, but what they'll also do is pick up small fish fry, like American shad, after they hatch. So they do these sampling surveys. What's really funny is these guys come out of Palatka or other parts of the state. They come here five or six times. They go to the same place and they take a little snapshot of what's happening in the river. And then they write a little report about where the American shad major spawning areas are. Well, I can tell you, not just because of my observations, but observations from guys who've been fishing it for 50 years, they're close, but not even, it, they're not that accurate. They get some good spots, but there are places miles up the river that these guys have no idea how the hell to get to. They don't have airboats. They're running in conventional boats. And when they get here, they go for the easiest spot. They take a survey. Some of these places where the American shad are really thick in their spawning, year after year, they're going to put a, a giant pump, and they're going to pump water out of the St. John's River. And they say they're only going to do it during the rainy season when there's an abundance of water. But we all know that once they get it started, they have a foothold, guess what happens? And if you need water, they're going to get it. Um, so they have taken money and they're now trying to figure out how to spawn American shad, which should be a warning sign because they're getting ready to mitigate whatever damage they're going to do. 
And uh, they want to ward it off by a PR campaign by saying, oh, we're, we're stocking fish. You can grab anybody out here coming out of the place next door drinking a beer and say, hey, we're putting fish back in the St. John's River. They'll be really happy. Oh, yeah, we're taking care of nature. Well, we screwed it in the first place. And these guys, I mean, now we're, anyway, I won't go too much more into it. But I'm pretty passionate about it. We've screwed up enough stuff in the state. It's, it's fallen apart pretty fast. There's some vestiges that we can hang on to. But it's these campaigns. And, and it's funny, when I was a kid, I was not political. I'm still not really political. I'm just pissed off about stuff. And I would bump into these crazy old guys at the boat ramps, and they're spewing off about stuff. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, when you see me and you do this, I'll understand that uh, <laughs> you think I'm like that now. So here's the research boat. And these guys are great biologists, but you know what? They've been with the company, or with the company, with the uh, um, agency for years. They're not going to buck it. They're going to get their pensions. They're the old guard, and um, you know they're never going to say anything against what they're doing. So hopefully the sun is not setting on the St. Johns River. Uh, I took this Monday. This is uh, Possum Bluff, and uh, it's about four and a half miles north of State Road 520. Uh, it's a little airboat rest on the St. John's River. And just around the corner is the Beeline Expressway back over here. Um, lots of fish there, certain times. You've got to do the research. Um, you have to go look. Got to go figure it out and see if there's anything else. Um, I'm offering this this year. This is crazy, I know. You're going, what the heck? Uh, I'm a guide, and... Um, I try to do things a little differently and make it different and unique for people that are visiting here from other parts of the world. I've fly fished in helicopters in New Zealand, British Columbia. Loved it. Has anybody else done it? It's neat. You jump in a helicopter, they take you up into the back country, someplace that would take you days to, to hike into. Um, so I'm going to be offering this kind of a crazy, fun, you know, break the bank and let's go jump in a helicopter. Four people, myself and then, uh, then a pilot. And uh, we will be literally on top of the fish. Um, so when we land, we're going to be right where they're supposed to be. And I've got some cards I can pass out if you're interested. And uh, there's a shad. And this is a rough production. <laughs> That's my dog, Annie, for Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Anything that I went over too fast on? The first guy that has ever said color doesn't matter. Have you heard that before? I'm mean, just refreshing. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear it because it'll save me a lot of time. Out well, of the river. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's color. There's a great book called Founding Fish by John McPhee. Yeah, I was going to say. Wonderful book, but he's wrong on two counts. One, he talks about the St. John's River shad dying after they spawn. And then the second thing he says is he doesn't understand why we fish for shad in the middle of the day, and if you go up north, they catch them at dusk and dawn. Guys, take a sample of our water and take a sample of the water up north. Hold them side by side. Ours looks like tea because it's tannic stained, and theirs up north is clear. These fish, they live at 1,000 feet off of our continental shelf because they've caught them in big otter trawls out there saning. They have big eyes like a swordfish that you know, is a night feeder. They come up into our river... You know, one day they're out there avoiding sharks, and literally a week later, they're in a cattle pasture 25 miles away from Disney, <laughs> Mickey Mouse, with gators, and they're sitting there in rivers that are, are water that might be four or five feet deep. They're fully exposed, they're not comfortable, but yet they're comfortable enough to spawn, and as the water's receding, you know, they want to find their comfort zone. They're eating. The hickory shad are eating, the studies show that they're eating. The uh, American shad are eating. Uh, anybody that has caught enough American shad have seen their flies or lures down inside their throats, right? I mean, they are wolfing that thing down. Um, my friends who caught them in June, those fish were thick across the back, not emaciated. Uh, and you will catch fish that have sores on them. There are going to be fish that are going to die. It's a stressful thing. But generally speaking, they're eating and they're best time to fish for them, I call them yuppie fish because you can sleep in, uh, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. I have gone out at first light and I've caught them and I've stayed till dark and I've caught them. But it, they're pretty accommodating. Okay. Can, so 
the white fellow from his editing sign for Curly Fisher. That's a great sign. You're asking because you know something. Yeah. Okay. But then you're the shattered here when they're gone, shattered gone. Well, they all migrate down, but here's something that's really cool about the uh, white pelican. First of all, they don't dive like a brown pelican. They don't get up in the air and then plummet down and go after fish. They're filter feeders. So that, it, it, right there by Puzzle Lake, I have gone along and I've seen way in the back all the pelicans sitting back there and getting, you know, rousted by the air boaters. Later in the day, you'll see them along the river in certain stretches. And they're all standing there and it's like, what are they doing here? So when it starts to get dark and the shad start washing and spawning, these big white pelican start following the shad. Not only are they trying to eat some of the bigger ones, the, the shad, which I don't even know if they can swallow them, to be honest with you, but they're getting the eggs that are being fertilized. And they're, once again, they can hold 600,000 eggs, but they're batch spawners. They'll release 50,000 eggs at a time, 30,000 eggs at a time. So for a hungry pelican, that's caviar. I mean, we like it, right? Crackers love it. Um, so these pelicans, they've been coming here for 10,000 years. They see those fish washing, and um, they go right in there after the, uh, the birds. They will dive in the dark. They'll hear them. They'll see them. They'll go after them. And they'll, they'll open up their mouths, and they'll start scooping up the eggs right there in the water. It's pretty amazing. It's a really neat phenomenon. And when you see them lined up along the bank, put a little mental note in your head and come back to that area. Or fish it then when you're there, and uh, you'll find fish. Yes. Let's talk about the leaders. I usually go fishing with the uh, sinking, sinking board. And um, uh, you said you don't use them. I fish in three feet of water. You're probably fishing down at Mullet Lake Park and dredging. Sometimes. Okay. Um, I hardly ever use a sink tip. I'll use, if I want to get down deeper, I'll put on a longer leader, go maybe nine or ten feet, and use a heavier fly. And that's it. And just let it swing. But the key is, in the problems that you were having recently, is just the current is so strong. The current's crazy. Right now, it's about 1,600 cubic feet per second. This time of year, the median current is like 800. So... We're up there, but it is dropping fast. And it's funny, I've got on my phone, you can sign up on that website for an alert that'll send an email to you at a certain level. And it, I set it for, I think, five and a half feet. And every day it'll tell me what the level is. And once the plug is pulled, I mean, it starts dropping really fast. And once it's within the riverbanks, a week can make all the difference in the world. A spot that was really good before I may go there and poke around, and I'm putting together some other things that I've been noticing. I'm not going to publish it yet, but you know I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, I just want to make sure that my information is accurate. And maybe next year or the year after that, I'll have something else that corroborates some ideas that I've been working on. Uh, I kind of jumped ahead there. You know, this is really simple fishing. Um, if you want to get down deep, just longer leader and, and a heavier fly. That's it. But where I fish up that way... There's some spots there are like uh, 12 or 14 feet. You're not... I don't even bother with that. I don't even want to fish there. I really don't. I just, I, you know, casting out and dredging. I mean, I'm looking. We can sight fish these fish. Anybody know Steve Kantner, the land captain down in Fort Lauderdale? He writes for Florida Sportsman, all these magazines. Crazy guy. A lot of fun. We were skating muddlers on the surface, creating a little V-wake and getting surface strikes by shad because they thought it was a little minnow coming up on the surface. Just fun stuff. You know, and it, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you know, you'll get the same thing. Um, what I'll do is I'll go catch a couple of fish. I mean, I know guys, they'll see me catching fish and we're good friends. They'll wave and they're like, heading up, heading up, because they want to go up and find out how far this run is this stretch of fish and we'll go way way up and then it'll start getting in my head I want to figure out are they farther up or are they way back down that way so I'll catch four or five or six you know I don't need to catch 50 uh, there are days where I'll catch 50 or you know maybe more and um, I'll sit on the boat smoke a cigar and uh, try to not catch them and figure out what they're not going to or what they wouldn't eat normally um, and I did tell you about being in the boat with thousands of dollars a gear, and these guys are using cane poles. 
and we're having a great time. I did say that, didn't I? Okay. It's just a fun fish. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. It's okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, you're talking about, like, Puzzle Lake. Are you talking about the bends right before it comes into Puzzle Lake? Uh, before, before it comes in or before it goes, after it comes out? Which, I mean, okay. Um, when you leave State Road 46 and you go by the Econ and you go around the corner, you go through what's referred to as Waterman's Bend. Charlie Waterman used to fish there. Um, then you come up into Puzzle Lake. That whole area between uh, Waterman's Bend and the exit point of Puzzle Lake is really good. Then once you get through Puzzle Lake and get to the other side, there's a few bends. One in particular referred to as the S Bend. And it's a huge, okay, it's a huge bend. There's always a bunch of airboaters sitting up there. They're catching catfish. Um, that is a phenomenal area, and that's where last year the pelicans were coming out of the back area, and they were just downstream of the S Bend. There's no secrets with this. I mean, tomorrow is a different day than it was last week, and two weeks from now is going to be completely different about today. And if you think fishy and pay attention and look at the birds and, and run, and you find the fastest water flow on the slowest day, that's where you want to go. That's where right you, now you're looking for slower water flow. I'm looking for confined water flow. So Mullet Lake, um, Shad Alley, it's confined. There's fish there. Um, you go all the way up to Harney, through Harney, between Harney and um, uh, 46, Jolly Gator. There's a couple of big bends right there. There's some fish there. There's fish right now. Whether or not they're going to eat or you're going to get down to them, you know, that's where you know the sinking tip is going to help. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather take a stick in the eye than dredge 12 feet deep. I would rather go way up and run up to 520 or go to 192, come back down through Lake Washington, drag my little boat over the weir, because the weir stops the fish from going up through Lake Washington. Back in the old days, the, sa uh, salmon, the shad would go all the way up to Lake Helen Blazes. They'll also go up to Salt Lake. You know where Salt Lake is in Lofman? Um, it's, uh, as you're going uh, east on 46, there's uh, Six Mile Creek or whatever it is out there, it's almost not even moving water. And you run an airboat through there, the shad are jumping up onto the bank. So it's not even a really big current. And the fish are there. And you go up inside Wakaiva, there's fish in Wakaiva as well. Problem with Wakaiva is it's mostly hydrilla and, and vallison area. There's not a lot of sandy areas. So there's a small remnant population that, that still goes in there. And I think our fish are so unique. Anybody know Darwin, Charles Darwin? Not personally, but you know, know about him. Um, the Galapagos <coughs> Islands. There's islands that are within eyesight, 10 miles away on the horizon. They had different finches than what they had on this island. Genetically, they were different. You know, we've got this unique run of fish here that I think are so specific to the St. Johns River that, you know, supposedly they go all to the same place and feed, but yet they come back and they're not any bigger than the fish that were feeding in the same area for five or six years. I don't think ours go up there. I think ours are somewhere else, and uh, we have a unique population. And it's not worth it to FWC or anybody to make these a specific one because they're going to be damaging them here in the next couple of years, at least the water management districts are. So anyway, that's it. Uh, if you have any other questions, I've got cards here, and uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. If you see me on the river, I run a little camouflage, skinny boat, little gladesman. A uh, little 15 horse, uh, wave at me, f you know, do this. Tell me to come over. I'll tell you exactly what I found, where they are, what's going on. I might be wearing a buff and I look really mean, but I'm just trying not to get burned and have my wife yell at me. Um, so if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to give me a shout and, uh, and I'll keep you on top of it. I got business cards right in here. I hope I answered some of your questions and uh, made you think a little bit about these fish. Thanks, guys.